like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Cameron Khan. Dr. Khan is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Public Health at the University of Toronto. He's a practicing physician, an infectious disease expert. He's also the founder and CEO of Blue Dot Inc., which is artificial intelligence to predict the behavior of pandemics by developing predictive algorithms. Blue Dot accurately predicted the spread of the coronavirus before it was categorized as a pandemic. So Dr. Khan, I'd like you to take it away and you're going to be discussing the role of big data analytics in a post pandemic world. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Mary, and, and good afternoon uh, now from, from Toronto uh, in Canada here. Um, I'm going to just share my, I've got some slides. Let me see if I can share those and see if you are able to see those. Um, I'm just going to have to hit play here. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation today. I'll, I'll be speaking about the role of data and analytics and how we can be using uh, these tools to build greater resilience to the growing number of epidemic threats that we are, are facing in our world today. I'm going to just start out here with this image. Speaking of data, this is a map of the world that is just based on the world's commercial air travel data. Um, what you can see here, uh, as, as you can perhaps uh, appreciate from this image, this is a world map. It, this is looking at how the world's cities are interconnected through commercial air travel. And I think it reveals a number of things, uh, you know, not only some of the physical geography of the world, but also some of the social fabric of how the global community is is interconnected and i think there are also some important insights about the economic geography you can see certainly some areas of the world that are far more industrialized um, but also other parts of the of the globe that are uh, less developed and perhaps more vulnerable uh, as we look forward to um to global epidemics and pandemics um what i do think this highlights and really reveals is perhaps most importantly, just how interconnected our world is. Uh, and of course, with that interconnectedness uh, comes interdependence as well. So what I'd like to do is take a moment and just reflect a little bit on, you know, where we have come from in the past few decades. I think we can all agree that this has been an incredibly painful uh, pandemic. Um, and that we want to get out of it as soon as we can and as safely as we can. But I'm, I'm sure we can all agree that we do not want to be back in the next pandemic anytime soon. So I'm going to just take us through for a moment. So this actually, I think, picks up on one of the comments earlier that, you know, the pandemic will end. And, and absolutely, I would agree, you know, this, this will pass. Um, but I think it's important to just ask ourselves, where have we come from in the last few decades? So clearly we are here in the worst pandemic in 100 years uh, with COVID-19, but it wasn't that long ago, uh, you may remember in 2016, that another virus, Zika virus, uh, was spreading across Latin America and was causing these pretty profound birth defects in newborns, causing microcephaly and other types of birth defects. It was a year before that. This image used to uh, be fairly jarring when people looked at it, a, a wedding with people wearing masks. Today, it, it seems perhaps a little less jarring as we're going through COVID-19, but this is in Seoul in South Korea. And this was an outbreak of MERS or the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, another novel coronavirus that um, caused a, a deadly outbreak back in 2015. And the year before that, you'll recall that we had the largest outbreak of Ebola virus in history in West Africa, which uh, you know cost us thousands of lives and also um, spread to other countries uh, across the globe. The year before that, there was an outbreak of a, a virus called chikungunya, which quickly spread, started in the Caribbean and uh, uh, rapidly spread across Latin America through this mosquito here, a uh, type of 80s mosquito. Um, it was only about 10 years ago that we actually were in another pandemic, and perhaps maybe we've, we've forgotten that, but the H1N1 influenza pandemic 
um, which was thankfully not as severe of, as perhaps the Spanish flu or, or what we're going through today with COVID-19, but a pandemic nonetheless that spread around the world at, at unprecedented speed. And my career as an infectious disease physician began six years before that in 2003. Um, this experience has been a bit of deja vu for me, as you can imagine, um, back in 2003, a novel coronavirus emerged in Guangdong province, uh, spread around the world, showed up in hospitals, infected healthcare workers, led to the deaths of people in our city, uh, had massive economic and social impacts. Um, that was with SARS-CoV, and then here we are with SARS-CoV-2. Um, the first outbreak, of course, crippled cities uh, across the planet. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 has pretty much crippled the entire planet. Um, so I think some of the questions here are, what can we learn from these various events? And I think one of the, the perhaps the most obvious learnings and lessons from these experiences is that in our hyper-connected world, outbreaks spread incredibly quickly. And that if we want to stay a step ahead of them, that means that we will have to come up with ways of moving even faster. Um, thankfully, we are in an interesting era where we have growing access to data. We have a lot of the raw materials to do that. Growing access to big data, advanced analytical tools like machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, and other types of digital and information technologies, the internet, that can allow us to disseminate and spread uh, insights around the world faster than the outbreaks themselves can spread. But of course, bringing all those materials and pieces together is, uh, you know, a very, um, uh, it's a not a small undertaking. This is something that um, I have been involved in in my role as an academic for the last 18 years since the SARS outbreak and the last seven years um, founding Blue Dot, uh, which uh, Mary, as you mentioned, is a, is a digital health company um, that I founded largely to try and translate some of the scientific research and discoveries uh, I was doing as an academic into digital solutions that allow us to move faster uh, and try and get in front of these types of threats. For the last seven years, our eclectic team of, uh, of doctors and veterinarians and epidemiologists and geographers and data scientists, engineers, uh, we've all been working together to build what we refer to as an early warning system for epidemics. There are three main pillars, and I'll just walk you briefly through how technology and data and analytics are allowing us to, uh, to, to move uh, much more quickly than we, we were able to in the past. The first pillar is really on detection of outbreaks and threats uh, and uh, to, to, to be able to generate much more of a global panoramic view of what is happening uh, in the world. Second, to be able to assess uh, these threats in terms of their ability to, dis to, to spread. And we know that uh, outbreaks can spread across borders and across continents in hours or days, um, as well as to assess what the impacts and consequences may be of a case that has shown up in another geographic area in the world. And finally, those insights have to be translated into something that's actionable. Uh, and so that is another key pillar that we've been doing a lot of work on uh, so that we can not only disseminate some of these insights to the public sector with government, but also the private sector, the healthcare uh, sector as well. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in, in just a moment. Um, really briefly on this first pillar, um, Artificial intelligence can help us augment our abilities to detect epidemic threats and, and do this in a timely manner. Uh, what we've been working on at Blue Dot is um, generating, uh, having our engineers curate information that is being officially reported through public health agencies across the globe and automatically extracting and synthesizing all of those notifiable diseases. But we're complementing that information with unofficial reports things that may be reported in a local um, news, uh, you know, uh, local media online uh, or in a health forum or healthcare blog. Um, we've been using uh, natural language processing and machine learning to curate data on over 150 different diseases and syndromes, gathering this intelligence in 65 different languages and doing this every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day. Now, that would require a pretty large team of subject matter experts to go through all of that, but this is where machine learning and AI can really augment our capability. So to distinguish that, you know, a particular article 
maybe about the heavy metal band anthrax or another article maybe about a real outbreak of anthrax. Um, these types of analytical tools can allow us to extract key pieces of information to eliminate noise, to extract information about the pathogen or the syndrome, the location, the time, contextual factors such as case counts, deaths, et cetera. And so ultimately it is these um, analytical tools that can allow us to take vast amounts of unstructured text data and to process it, organize it, structure it by place, time, and uh, the name of the pathogen. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, diseases spread incredibly quickly. And this image, of course, uh, is perhaps a little bit um, uh, less uh, consistent or compatible with the way that air travel is moving uh, in 2020, but certainly in years gone by, um, the world is increasingly mobile. In 2019, there were over 4 billion passengers that boarded flights and traveled around the world. Almost 7 trillion kilometers traveled uh, on commercial flights worldwide. Um, and so this is the conduit for how diseases can spread. The platforms that we've been building are the AI that is gathering and processing all of this intelligence through uh, unofficial and uh, official sources online is talking to the system that is analyzing the entire world's commercial air travel data, all of the flight schedules across the planet, the passenger level anonymized flight itineraries. Uh, so you can see from this image here, which was generated in just about a second or two uh, on the morning of December 31st, when our platform picked up an unusual cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan, uh, in China, uh, this is revealing some of those nonstop flights. You can see some of them into places like New York City and San Francisco. And then the circles are the final destinations of those travelers. The um, analytics here, we published the first peer reviewed um, publication or scientific study on COVID-19. Again, this was before it had its name, uh, really just at the, uh, even actually prior to it, it being recognized as a coronavirus and highlighting a number of these key cities, places like Bangkok and Tokyo were at the top of, of that list. And it turned out that Bangkok and Tokyo, for example, were the, the number one and number two cities that actually received cases of COVID-19 after it uh, appeared outside of mainland China. So we've been using these kinds of arcs to be able to identify the places downstream that may be thousands of kilometers away, but which need to be aware of and notified of potential risks uh, from an epidemic that they may be completely unaware of. Now, as a frontline healthcare worker and a practicing infectious disease physician, you know, I've really seen and, and I'm trained as a public health physician, I've really seen a bit of a disconnect between a panoramic view that our public health community has, which is to really understand what's happening in the population <clears throat> versus the frontline healthcare worker who has a much more myopic view of the world. So when an outbreak occurs, generally speaking, it's the public health sector that may hear about this first, um, and then there's a bit of a trickle over effect where healthcare workers, hospitals, et cetera, are learning about it uh, thereafter. Uh, that can be a real challenge and a risk because sick patients don't show up in the public health department, they show up in the emergency department. And for many clinicians, um, you know, we maybe have never been trained to uh, manage these diseases or may not have even potentially heard of these diseases. Uh, ever before. So really critical that um, these insights are reaching these audiences in a timely manner. And then, of course, the private sector and the general public are often then lagging further behind and learning about these um, these particular events later in the process. We've always envisioned and imagined we have certainly the technical capabilities to be doing this in a more contemporaneous way. Uh, a lot of our work at Blue Dot has been working with government agencies across multiple different branches of government, public health, uh, national defense, national security, agriculture, and really trying to um, generate this type of epidemic intelligence so that we can make timely decisions. Uh, because as we've learned with COVID-19, you know, time is our most valuable resource. It gives us an opportunity to mitigate the impacts from an outbreak. I've spoken about the ability and the, the necessity of getting this into the frontline uh, healthcare community. And so we've been working with hospitals and emergency departments to make sure that the triage every time a patient comes into a hospital can, can make use of this type of intelligence, as well as giving healthcare workers a bit of a heads up that um, they should be thinking about um, a particular disease. You can imagine during you know early January when 
most clinicians would be thinking about influenza, it would be worthwhile knowing that there is perhaps another outbreak occurring uh, involving a respiratory illness that may look like influenza. Um, and also, we've been working with um, private sector organizations like airlines and commercial airports so that they can not only protect their employees, but also uh, make sure they're protecting passengers and, and their, their key stakeholders. So this is an important ecosystem that I think will be uh, very important for us to build out uh, as we look beyond this pandemic. Now, what I'd like to do in just the last moment or two here is just say that um, data and analytics and technology can really allow us to become, uh, you know, better firefighters, if you will. We can, you know, pick up the, the smoke at an earlier stage, mobilize a timely response and, and mitigate some of the consequences. But I think it's also important for us, especially as we're talking about um, settlements across the world and population growth and urbanization is to be thinking about what are the underlying drivers of where are these, you know, various uh, novel uh, viruses and pathogens and outbreaks, where are they coming from? And I think one of the important lessons for us is that the vast majority of these outbreaks that we are seeing are coming from viruses that were initially found in animal populations, uh, in some instances in livestock, like influenza viruses, uh, and in other instances from wild animals like coronaviruses. Um, so it's going to be very important for us as we look past this pandemic to not just focus on better firefighting and using data and analytics and technology to move smarter and faster, but ultimately to be asking ourselves, are there ways that we can design our cities and think about how we are interacting with the rest of our planet uh, so that we're minimizing the sparks that could ignite the next dangerous outbreak or pandemic. And I think this is a really, really important point um, because our health and our security and our prosperity are really intertwined with the health of other living systems uh, across our globe. Um, so I, I'd like to perhaps end there and, and just leave that thought uh, for us uh, perhaps during the, uh, the Q&A session. Let me see if I can stop sharing my screen here. Okay, there we go.